So uh, this is still 3.1. Uh, we'll finish up 3.1. We'll get started, do a little bit of 3.2, and then I think that would be good. On Tuesday, we'll review. I'll try to get a review sheet out uh, over the weekend. Try to. Uh, or maybe by today. Wow. <laughs> If I just give you last semester's exam, that would work, right? Yeah. So, um, I think it's everything. Chapters one, two, three. So these uh, word problems. So now we, what we want to do is we want to be able to set them up. And now that we can set them up, we should be able to solve for them uh, because we know how to solve for a few of these already. <clears throat> All right. Um, so make sure we're looking for a as the amount of uh, salt or some sort of solution, mixing two salt solutions with differing concentrations gives rise to first order differential equations for the amount of salt contained in the mixture. So A is the amount of salt that's contained in the mixture. And uh, we basically just want to find the uh, amount of salt um, that's going in, input rate, uh, minus the output rate. That seems fairly straightforward. Uh, let's see how easy it actually is. All right, let's do an example where we have a tank of uh, 200 liters of fluid, uh, which uh, 30 grams of salt is dissolved. So that's the starting point. So I think with that sentence, we kind of already have uh, um, our initial condition. Uh, brine containing one gram of salt per liter is pumped into the tank at a rate of four liters per minute. So there's a lot of rates going on in here. Um, one gram of salt per liter, and then it's pumping it at four liters per minute. Uh, the well mixed solution, so it gets into this thing and it gets mixed up. The well mixed solution is pumped out of the tank. Um, at the same rate. So uh, I think the rate is four liters per minute. And we want to find A of T. <clears throat> so that's just the salt in grams. All right, so we want to figure out what the amount going in is, the amount going out. Uh, first of all, I guess we can already identify uh, that this is 30 grams, that's our starting point in the tank. So A of zero is equal to 30 grams. And A is the amount of grams, so A is going to have to be in grams. It's not a rate, it's the amount. <clears throat> and we want DA, DT. Yeah. Uh, I think the idea that it's dissolved just means that there's 30 grams in the tank. And so we're just looking for the amount of grams in the tank. Now, when we start thinking about pumping out of the tank, then that would be negative. That would, yeah, that would turn out to be negative. So we need R in and R out. And we need to know what this is. So the rate, so R stands for rate in this case, the rate going in and the rate going out. So what's going in? Um, one gram of salt per liter is pumped into the tank at the rate of four. Uh, T, by the way, is time. So we can just assume that DADT is the amount of grams 
it's changing the amount of grams per minute. I guess that's min, huh? Amount of grams per minute. So uh, we want our units to be consistent with R in and R out. So we want R in to be the amount of salt grams per minute that's going into it. And then the R out would be the amount of salt grams per minute going out. So, um, what should R in be equal to? So, one gram per liter times four liters per minute. That look okay so that's the amount of salt that's going in that's how your amount in the tank is changing so how much water is going out liters per minute Any ideas? Just the same? So is it also one gram per liter and four liters per minute? Known over 200. Where'd 200 come from? Oh, the liters? Trying to move. Should there be two hundred? Okay, let's let's talk about liters. How many liters are getting pumped out? For it says the same amount uh, pumped out at the same rate, right? So it'll be four liters per minute is getting pumped out. That's what that's what we want to find out. How much salt is in the tank as it's getting pumped out? Yeah. Thirty grams? No, that's the that's the starting point. That's what? Yeah, so you need the, the concentration of the what's in the tank, right? And so the idea is that this is the picture that they have in the book. Uh, water is getting pumped in at four liters per minute. And then it's getting pumped out at four liters per minute. And then so the concentration of the water going in is one gram per liter, right? And so it's getting mixed up in here. And what's the concentration of the water coming out? 30 grams per 200 liters? Well, I think that's the amount of grams per 200 liters when it started. Oh, 
Oh, so the amount of salt divided by the amount of liters in the tank. How much? Uh, okay, okay. <laughs> yeah. So the thing is that the amount of salt is changing in the tank, right? But what we do know that is that there's always 200 liters in the tank. So we know that there's always 200 liters in the tank. But the amount of salt in the tank is changing. But we've said that A equals the amount of salt in the tank at any time T. So I think Luis is... Uh, Got it. It's eight grams of salt per 200 liters. You're kind of going that way. <laughs> that A. So you were looking for another expression for A, which started to get a little bit more complicated. So this is the R in and R out, and that's really what uh, the change is. So how should we? summarizes A is the amount of salt in the tank at time T 200 is the amount of water or amount of solution in liters in the tank. So A over 200 will give the concentration of the salt in the tank at any time T that's getting pumped out, provided that it's mixed really well. So A is the amount of salt in the tank at T, and then 200 is the amount of solution in liters and that's currently in the tank. It's always in the tank since it's always 200 liters. Okay. All right. Well, I think we have all the information. Oh, the rest is just math. <laughs> right. So we have uh, our initial condition. Uh, a of 0 is equal to 30, and we have our um, differential equation, the A dt is equal to Rn, positive, so that's 4, and then the liters are cancel, uh, 4 grams per minute, and uh, R out is the amount that's going out, so that would be um, what's... 4 over 1 over 50, or, yeah, 1 over 50, A grams per minute. So the amount of salt in the tank is changing, and it's changing by the minute, so, and the amount of salt is measured in grams, so it's, the derivative is going to be in grams per minute. And, well, this is just a first-order differential equation. Have you guys been practicing your first-order differential equation? Because I'm going to start skipping steps now. <laughs> All right. So we have dA dt. I'm going to rewrite it, putting a minus 1 over 50. A is equal to 4. So it looks like a first order differential. It actually, you can, it's separable, so you can do the separable, but. Oh yeah, I said that was an easier thing to do, huh? Yeah, well, I'm gonna do it this way. It's good practice. <laughs> so, yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Thanks. 
If you play with that 50 and then make it a separable differential equation, it might come out to be just as uh, easy. Uh, let's see. Um, integrating factor. Integral of e to the 1 over 50t. So that's e to the 1 over 50t. Got that? Um, no, I think we have to, so you can't just integrate this from here. Actually, I, maybe I should show you some of the things that I saw. I got kind of scared. Uh, people just integrated this and that's, that's, that's no good on the quiz. So. I got scared. Uh, <clears throat> so be careful. You know this is a, a this is a first order differential equation that you can either separate or you can integrating factor. So the integrating factor is going to be e to the one over fifty t. Right. So this is going to be uh, e to the one over fifty t. Should be in blue. times a equals, uh, and then we want to integrate essentially 4 e to the 1 over 50 t dt. And then uh, the integral of this is going to be um, 4 is a constant, 1 over 50. In the denominator, we'll bring a 50 on the numerator, so that will end, you'll end up with 200. So this would be 200 e to the 1 over 50t plus c. And then you would solve for um, the constant. Well, you're not solving for the constant. You solve for a by just dividing through by 1 over 50. So this is 200 plus c times e to the negative 1 over 50. So that's your general solution. I skipped a bunch of steps. So what I'd encourage you to do is that if you're taking notes, leave some space and then fill it in yourselves. Right? You have time to do that, right? Yeah, so I took the integral of both sides. Remember that this is a product rule of something, so DDT of something. So that got undone already. All right. <clears throat> so remember to practice this. You know, the whole point is that you you look at the lecture and if you understand it in class the first time you see it, then that's great. If you don't, take your lecture notes home with you and study it and fill in the blanks, right? So this whole idea of taking notes and then forgetting about your notes, not coming back to your notes, um, that's not gonna work. You have to actually figure out what happened in class and fill in all the blanks that are missing. So when I skip steps, your job is to go home and figure out what those steps are. Your job isn't to say, oh, he skips too many steps. I don't get it. Well, if you're copying it down, you still might not get it until you actually do it yourself. All right. <clears throat> so we have to find C. We're going to use the initial condition to find C, and that is uh, A is equal to 30 when T is equal to 0. And so C is going to equal to what? Right? 
And then you put that back in, and then you box your answer. A of t is equal to 200 minus 170e to the minus 1 over 50t. Which looks like it's a transient term. Which means in the long run, it'll just get really salty in there. Any questions? Yes. <laughs> Maybe two ish, six ish. Ish. All right, um, let's skip over this next example and go to circuits. But your notes will have this blank space that you can try it out if you want. <laughs> All right. Uh, circuits, series circuits, consider a single loop, LCR or LRC circuit. Uh, has an inductor, resistor, and a capacitor. Um, the current in the circuit after a switch is closed is denoted by I of T. So I is a current. All right? That's what you guys did today? Um, the charge on the capacitor at time t is q. The letters, the letters L, R, and C are uh, known inductance, resistance, and capacitance. And then they're constants. So there's a lot of laws here. Or there's there's a Kirchhoff's law. I, I said Kirchhoff. What? <clears throat> Series circuits. Um, uh, the voltage on a closed loop must equal to the sum of the voltage drops in the loop. Uh, the current I is related to the charge by uh, the derivative. I is equal to dq dt. So this is the inductor, the resistor, and the capacitance all going around in the loop. <clears throat> and uh, and somehow you get this thing. <laughs> A second order differential equation. So we're, we're, we don't know how to solve second order differential equations yet. Um, so, why is this a second order differential equation? <clears throat> so we're going to simplify our series circuits. And uh, so a series circuit that only contains a resistor and an inductor. So the capacitor is taken out. And then, uh, so if the capacitor is not included, then uh, your series circuit will just have L dQ or D, the, the second derivative of Q, plus R, the first derivative of Q. And then if you know that the derivative of Q is just I, then you have this uh, differential equation, which now we can handle because it's a first order differential equation. So current or in this case, the response system is a first order differential equation where we have to solve for the, the current. And 
And then there's another um, type of differential equation if you have the voltage drop across the capacitor um, with a capacitance C, then dQ or Q of T divided by C is uh, where Q is a charge. And then you have the law gives us some other simplified version of the second order differential equation. So now we're dealing with a, a first order differential equation in Q instead of in I. So these are the two cases that we're going to consider in terms of our circuit problems. Okay. And really all you have to do is remember these formulas. Hell, you don't even have to remember it, right? In your sheet of notes and put the test. <laughs> but you should know when these things are, are to be used. So the LR circuit will have this first order differential equation in I, and then the RC circuit will have this first order differential equation in Q. Say it again. Um, so this one does not have a capacitor involved. So it's just an LR, and the LR is a differential equation in the current. Um, this one, they gave a capacitor, but they took out the, what was the L again? Oh, it was, uh, inductor. So they take that out of this one, and then now you have just an RC circuit without the L. And then for that, you got a differential equation in Q. And if you want to know what I is, then you just take the antiderivative to get the, because you know that I is equal to dQ dt. So if you solve for this in terms of Q, then you can find out the current by taking the derivative again, or the antiderivative again. Okay. <clears throat> All right. Yeah. E of t is the, the power source, the uh, voltage. Okay. And for alternating currents, it's usually some sort of wavy function. All right, let's, uh, let's see if we could do, a, is there an example? Oh, it's a piecewise function. Wow. So this is an LR circuit. An LR circuit is defined by um, the variable conductor with inductance defined by this L. Um, find the current I if the resistance is 0.2 and uh, the voltage is 4. And then graph. All right. What was the differential equation again? Uh, let's go back. This is uh, an LR circuit. We'll be back there. Uh, so L, D, R, D, T, D, I, sorry. Plus what? <laughs> okay. So in real life situations, you'll have more of these restrictions, and that's why piecewise function is important. So, um, You'll have the inductance that's on for a certain amount of time, and then after 10 seconds it stops, and then you just have a uh, blank. And so they want to know what, what's happening here in this particular scenario. So what we have to do is that we could just use the same, um, use this L of T, and then restrict our domain from to go from 0 to 10, and then after that, assume it's equal to zero, in which case we'll have another differential equation that would look like it would be a lot easier and then we can figure out what happens then. So um, because of the piecewise nature of this function, 
we'll have uh, the first piece figured out over here, and then we'll have another piece uh, that would that we would deal with afterwards, and that's just L is equal to zero. That would make things a little bit easier for us. Okay. Yeah. Oh, that should be a T. Yeah. Change that in my notes. Do I have notes? All right. So let's see if we can do this problem. I think what we need to do is, uh, this is a function now, it's, it's a generally they're constants, but in this particular scenario, it looks like it's going to be a function. So let's uh, put in the function uh, when t is between 0 and 10, and that function is 1 minus 1 tenth t uh, times di dt plus, what was our resistance? And then e of t, which would generally be a wave function, is just a constant function. So it looks like it's a direct current coming in. Uh, so that would be 4. So this is your differential equation in I. Uh, it looks like it's a linear differential equation, first order linear. Um, I don't know if you can separate it. I don't think you could separate this one. So let's solve for it as if it was... Um, first-order linear differential equation. Um, so generally what we want to do is get di dt by itself. And so I want to divide out by this L expression. But let's rewrite L into a fraction. So this would be, I guess, 10 minus t divided by 10. Is that right? Is that what it is? <clears throat> so that's what L is, right? So if I divide out by this, I'm going to have uh, di dt by itself plus uh, 0.2 times 10 minus t over 10. So we can do some stuff here. Uh, times i equals 4 times 10 minus t over 10. What's uh what's this? This is uh, I don't know, divided by two hundred or something. What is this? <laughs> two tenths. Divided by 50, right? Did that did that happen correctly? Oh, so it should be 10 over 10 minus t. Oh, so then if we multiply this, uh, just 2. And then this would be 40. 
Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, because when you do that, your integrating factor will will be something. Yeah, they'll will have a natural log in there. So let's see our integrating factor. Let's do this in a different color. So this isn't as easy as the other integrating factor. This might require a little bit more work. Uh, so the integrating factor is going to be e to the integral of this thing. So the integral, there's a 2 that's a constant, and then you would do a u substitution, and then it will be 1 over u, but then there's a negative sign in front of the t that would come out. So that's what that's what's going to go in there, and then we know that the t values are between zero and ten. So we can this is a case where we can drop the absolute values if we want. Uh, but then to simplify this, we could take this as a power of the ln, and then e and then the ln would undo each other. So it'll just be negative. So that's your integrating factor. Yeah. Uh, the two comes out as negative, and then a u substitution in here uh, would come out with a negative sign uh, because it would say u equals ten minus t. So that negative one will come out. Okay, so now that I know my integrating factor, I know that the whole left side is going to be, you know, a, a power, a product rule. So the product is going to be the, the integrating factor 10 minus t to the negative 2 times i. And then I would integrate both sides, but I would need to multiply this side as well. So 40 10 minus t times 10 minus t to the negative 2. Yeah, so you can combine them and then it will be, it looks like it'll be substitution. I guess I should have put to the negative 3, huh? Yeah, but if I see the negative 3 here, it'll keep me from thinking about the natural log because this is not the natural log anymore. So another u substitution will come out with a negative sign. So it would be negative 40. So this negative comes out of the u substitution. The 40 is a constant that would come out. And then this would be um, 10 minus t to the, you add 1. And then you divide by that same number. So negative, negative, cancel, 40, 20. So that would be a 20 divided by 10 minus t squared plus c. So. Yeah, that would cancel out. So before we do that, though, um, I guess we could do it now. I was going to say, uh, in terms of your initial condition, there's a couple of options to take. One of them is to figure out your initial condition now because you got your C's, and if your T is a nice number that you can just work out, then that's fine. Uh, or you can actually go ahead and solve for I and then put in the initial condition. So um, 
I want to kind of leave that option open, but I think it's just as easy if we solve for i. So let's solve for i. Uh, i is equal to, and then these are the, these things would cancel. This would just leave me a 20. And this would be 10 minus t positive 2. So that's squared. Um, now your initial condition is, uh, the initial current is zero. Yeah, so I of zero, zero. So zero is equal to 20 plus C times 10 squared. So negative. So I guess that's 0.2. Sure. So the I of T is equal to at least from 0 to 10. I of T is equal to 20 minus 0 0.1 fifth is 0 0.2, right? Um, times 10 minus T squared. Yeah, you can leave this fraction. <laughs> okay. So when L is equal to zero, then what happens when L is equal to zero? I guess it would just be zero, would it? This ten? So L equal to zero for this case. Uh, zero di dt plus zero point two i equal to four. Yeah. Yeah, when t is oh yeah, t is bigger than or equal to ten. Yes. All right. So i is equal to What's this? 20. Right? 4 divided by 0 0.2. 0 0.2 is 1 fifth, so reciprocal, that would be 20. That's it. So then your I function is going to be uh, 20 minus 0 0.2, 10 to the minus t squared if t is between 0 and 10. 10? And it would be 20 if uh, t is bigger than or equal to 10. L is equal to zero when um, when t is equal to ten because the function L of t says it's equal to some function between zero and ten, and it's equal to zero if t is bigger than ten. So for t is bigger than ten, this is a case that we have. Say it again. Yeah, the DIDT. Well, that DIDT is not zero, but it'll if you're multiplying it by zero, that term goes away. All right, we're supposed to graph this. Boy, yeah. How do you graph it? Oh, why not? I mean, now that we did it in class, it's fair game, right? <laughs> uh, I forgot how it goes. I keep forgetting how to do piecewise functions. Oh, uh, never mind.
All right, so this is the graph. We have uh, a bit of a parabola that's going down. So this is uh, up to 10. Uh, this is your, your 20 right here. So they actually meet. It turns out to, to still be a continuous curve. So this piece of the graph is y is equal to 10 minus 0 0.2, 10 minus t squared. And then here's your constant, y is equal to 20. And then, so that's the piecewise function. Um, yeah. That look right? The parabola is going upward. Yeah, it sounds like this, this is the I function. It should start at zero. Oh, this this might not be right. Let's, uh, let's graph it. Ah, how do you do piecewise functions? Keep forgetting. Control F, here it goes. Control Shift F. Control Shift A. What? So control shift F. Oh, there it goes. So our function is uh, 10 minus 0 0.2, um, 10 minus T squared if 0 less than or equal to, oh, I have to use X. X less than 10. Control shift A, right? Whoa. Undo. Control shift A. There he goes. Control shift F. Control shift F. <laughs> Zero. No. 10, 20. Uh, X is bigger than 10. There's a T. I thought I changed this. This should be 20. Did I? Why do I have 10? That's <laughs> 20. My two started to look like a one. All right, let's see if we can get a better picture. All right, that's a better picture. What happened? All right. Ooh.
So we have all the, the features that we were looking for. We started at zero. Uh, we have this y is equal to 20. And we have this function y is equal to 20 minus 0 0.2 and minus t. What? Um, and then it's still continuous, so I think that looks good. All right, questions? Okay. So uh, there's a couple more linear differential equations, first order linear. Uh, there's air resistance, motion, drug dissemination memorization. But we're going to move on to uh, some nonlinear models, a couple of them. All right, so this nonlinear model that we're going to look at is called the logistic model. Actually, the logistic model has, um, has a couple of P's in it now, or a couple of the dependent variable. So really, this is P times A minus B times P squared, and then it makes it not a differential, not a, not a first order linear differential equation anymore. So this is sometimes used when you're looking at uh, comparing um, things that are happening. Uh, one of the common problems that, that's used here is like uh, how disease spreads or something like that. When one person got, has a, some sort of disease and then they make contact with other people and then it, it kind of spreads exponentially <laughs> or logistically. But then... There's a population cap, so usually the logistic model, instead of instead of going up forever, uh, it, there's there's usually a cap to it. So instead of having that regular exponential function, it goes up and then it levels off at some point. So there's usually a, a leveling off period or a leveling off point. <coughs> so let's do an example here. Let's see. Uh, let n be the number of supermarkets throughout the country that are using uh, computerized checkout systems described uh, by the initial value problem. So the initial value problem has, uh, you know, the differential equation and initial condition. And uh, it says here, use a phase portrait um, concept to predict how many supermarkets are expected to adapt the new procedure over a long uh, period of time by hand sketch the solution curve of a given initial um, value. So you remember that uh, what kind of differential equation is this that does not have the independent variable as part of the equation? Somebody said it last time. What? What? Autonomous. Autonomous. So this is an autonomous differential equation. It doesn't have, uh, it has the n, but th there's no t's aside from the, the dt. And so this tells us that we can use a face portrait, and then we have a general idea of how this is going to look like. And, and so um, what we could do, or what they're asking us to do, is do a face portrait. And remember that the face portrait is just the one-dimensional uh, graph of this and it looks like what we want to do is we want to essentially solve for um, when your slope is zero that's a leveling off period and so your slope is dn dt 
and the NTT is equal to this, we set this equal to zero, so either N is equal to zero, or one minus 0 0.0005 N is equal to zero, which is saying N is equal to, what is that? 5,000? <laughs> How many zeros? One, two, three. One, two, three, four. 5,000 or 50,000? What is it? It's it's fifty, right? I just moved the decimal point over so many times. How's that work? Well, I guess what? Two thousand? <laughs> it's not even five. Oops. Is it 2,000 or 200,000 or 20,000? <laughs> so it looks like it's going to be this. And if, if this is supposed to be uh, supermarkets adopting the, this computerized checkout system, we're starting from low to go up higher, so this should be an increasing. Um, so do you remember how to do a face portrait? We check here uh, numbers. If we could throw in a negative number for n, which doesn't make sense, but we'll do it anyways. If n was negative, we have a negative here. A negative negative is a positive, so this is going to go down. Uh, if we put a number between 0 and 2,000 in here, this would be a positive, and this would be a number between 0 and 2,000 that would still be less than 1, so 1 minus some number less than 1 is negative. Wait, negative? Oh, 1 minus a number less than 1 should be positive. Positive. And then if you put a number that's bigger than 2,000, this would make this uh, 0 0.0005n to be larger than 1. And so that's going to be negative. Uh, positive and negative will be negative. So that's your face portrait. Um, but we have n is equal to 0 is equal to, or n of 0 is equal to 1. So we're starting off here in this part of the face portrait, we're not doing n is negative. Uh, we're not doing n uh, to be bigger than 2,000. So n is going to be over here. So our graph would generally look like this. Should look like that. And you would have asymptotes. And if you were to graph, if you had n that's less than 0, which again wouldn't make sense in this scenario, but if you had n less than 0, it would be going down. And then if you had n bigger than 2,000, it would be going down. So this is your general face portrait. But uh, they want you to, to see that your solution should look like this. OK? <clears throat> so we got the general graph of the solution before we even found uh, the actual solution. So let's actually find a solution now. Solve the initial value problem, then graph, uh, use a graphing utility to verify your curve. And then they want to know what happens in 10 years, how many of these companies have the technology. So let's go ahead and solve for this. How would you solve for this differential equation? So it's not linear anymore, so we can throw that out the window. Uh, but we can use those other things that we learned. What do you propose we use? Remember what's the easiest thing to look for first? It's separable, right? 
Now, if you multiply the n and rearrange it, it probably will look like a Bernoulli differential equation, but Bernoulli requires some sort of substitution and stuff like that. So uh, you can do it that way, but if, if you go through a list in your head of techniques, then you should always ask yourself, is this separable? Because that's the easiest thing. Now, if it's not separable, you can't force it to be separable. I saw you guys try to separate some stuff in the last quiz and it wasn't separable. Uh, so be careful about the rules for, especially when you're adding things, you can separate things when you can't separate things. So dn, it looks like we can uh, divide by this thing. And then um, how would we solve for, how would we integrate that left-hand side? How? <laughs> you would integrate by using Wolfram Alpha, of course. <clears throat> no. How would you solve for it? I don't think ESA would work. How? Partial fractions. What? Is that what you said? <laughs> what happened? I need to do that. <clears throat> what happened? Oh, did I overdo the parentheses? Yeah. So ln x minus ln 2000 minus x. Let's see. Could have gotten that, right? I mean, I really wanted to do it, but I just, no time. <laughs> yeah, so the LOG in Wolfram Alpha is a natural log, so let's just call it natural log. So that's the left-hand side. Um, and the other side's t. And so the constant is actually going to go on the other side. So it'll be t plus c. Um, so this, by the way, you can also combine the natural logs, right? So this would be ln of uh, x divided by 2,000 minus x is equal to t plus c. And then you, you combine it because you're going to try to solve for x. I don't know how successful you'd be, but um, so e to t plus c, so it'll be x 2,000 minus x is equal to e to the t. And then the plus c, remember, can come down as a constant. So we can call that l or n sub 0. I don't know if we should call it n sub 0. Just call it a. <clears throat> and then, um, yeah, multiply and factor. So we can solve for the x, actually, the n. This should be n. 
Uh, we could solve for the n, but let's let's see if we could solve for that constant first. Uh, we'll use a, the initial condition, n of 0 is equal to 1, so we'll put 1 in for n. Uh, and then 0 in, so a, a is going to be equal to this thing, 1 over 1999. So n over 2,000 minus n is equal to 1999 e to the. <clears throat> um, so you guys know how to solve for n? This is solvable. Uh, so the other thing is that you probably should um, try to solve for uh, the, in, the dependent variable if you can. And you have to know when you can't solve for the dependent variable and just leave the answer implicit. So I'm going to leave the answer implicit because uh, I think my graphing program can actually handle that. So I want to graph, and I have to use y, y divided by 2,000 minus y equal to 1999. It's what? Oh, 1 over 1999. All right, let's see how this is going to look like. Not satisfied in the region. Let's see if we can zoom out enough. Hold on. Um, oh, 1 over, yeah. All right, maybe you zoomed out a little too much. Uh, so it has to go all the way up to 2,000. So let me squish this down. So here's when it gets squished down. And they want to know what happens when n is equal to 10, or when t is equal to 10 in 10 years. So in about 10 years, there's 100 and, uh, 1,837 stores that would have this. So when n is equal to, when t is equal to 10. Okay. All right. So uh, take a look at chapter three. That's going to be on the test. So try to do some of those problems. Try to fill in the blanks of some of the steps that I skipped in lecture and uh, do the homework and then get ready for the test. All right. Good luck. You guys got some uh, worksheets due too, I think. Right. <laughs>